My name is Brian O'Mahony. I'm here today with Adam Hutchings and with Michael Lauer. We're discussing comparative effectiveness research, health technology assessments, and economic assessments of haemophilia care. Comprehensive care is the accepted model internationally for haemophilia care. Treatment with coagulation factor concentrates, either on demand or prophylactically, is, is well established. Treatment prophylactically for children with severe haemophilia is the optimum standard of care. Haemophilia is a success story. The treatment of haemophilia over the past 20, 30 years has been a success story. With proper treatment, children with haemophilia can grow up and lead a normal quality of life. But we are not immune to the pressures of tightening economies, the global recession, and that's why we're here today to talk about the sort of measures that have been looked at in relation to looking at the cost effectiveness and the comparative effectiveness of haemophilia care. Factor is an expensive drug. It has now come on the radar screen of many governments and they will be looking at the effectiveness of treatment and in fact the first health technology assessment in haemophilia would take place in Sweden. So Adam if I can ask you first of all what are the pros and cons of health technology assessments and comparative effectiveness research specifically for haemophilia? In general a health technology assessment and comparative effectiveness research is a very good way of structuring decision makings in healthcare takes into account all the available evidence, it prioritises different types of evidence and, and it formulates it in a way that makes it comparable between different disease areas. So scientifically it's very robust and it's a strong framework for making decisions. In terms of haemophilia, the challenges come from the fact that because health technology assessment is very reliant on the quality of data and because haemophilia is a very rare disease, you don't necessarily have the same quantity of data to allow you to have a lot of certainty in, in your estimates of particular parameters which are important to making the decision. So there can be quite a lot of uncertainty when you're estimating the, the cost effectiveness of haemophilia because you may not have a, a really firm grasp on the, the clinical benefits associated with different forms of haemophilia care and different treatments. So um, definitely it's a, a good thing and something which helps decision making and makes it more scientific, but there are challenges to applying it to particular disease areas, particularly haemophilia. Michael, are HTAs and CERs a threat or an opportunity? I see them as a great opportunity. Now, comparative effectiveness research has actually been around for a long time. When we think about effectiveness research and what effectiveness research means, it means effectiveness from the point of view of the patient the kinds of outcomes that patients really care about. Length of life, quality of life, avoidance of major clinical events that would land you in, in the hospital or in an emergency room, and then costs. And those are the four types of outcomes that we need to specifically focus on because those are the four kinds of outcomes that patients and society really care about. Prophylaxis is the optimum therapy for children with haemophilia. Mm -hmm. It's also widely used for adults to prevent bleeding. Now, this is very likely to be one of the elements that's looked at in HTAs. So, how can we ensure that optimum care for haemophilia is continued and that the, the efficacy of prophylaxis is seen by the, the agencies when they're doing HTAs? Certainly, we have to collect data to allow us to demonstrate the benefits of prophylaxis. And it's important to collect the data in the way that is most um, applicable towards health technology assessment. But we also need to get long-term data. So when we're looking at health technology assessment, we're interested in the, the total benefit of the product over the patient's life. So it's important to have information on not only the bleeding rate, but the, the impact in terms of disability and, and subsequent quality of life impact of um, any particular haemophilia treatment. We also need supplemental data, often from sort of real-world sources, from registries and from haemophilia treatment centre databases, which show how much clotting factor people are consuming, the cost of that clotting factor, and then the particular outcomes in that HTC. So there's many different ways we can collect data, but basically the more data the better when it comes to participating in an HTA. Well, clinical scores, joint scores, number of bleeds? Absolutely. Okay. You need a very holistic picture of the benefits of treatment. The terminology can be quite intimidating for patient organisations, for clinicians, when you talk about quality adjusted life years and so on. 
What about looking at, while these are necessary, what about looking at bleeds avoided, at real clinical outcomes? That is a very important endpoint from a haemophilia specific perspective. Obviously, if you were trying to, um, to, to differentiate between a, two different treatment regimens and you could understand how many bleeds you get with each, that's very important if you're a haemophilia treater. The issue when it comes to health technology assessment is that the people who are making the decisions are making decisions about the entire healthcare budget in a particular country, and they're making decisions on how resources should be allocated between disease areas. And as such, if you know how many bleeds are being avoided, that's important in terms of haemophilia, but it doesn't help you compare the benefit you're getting from that investment with, say, the benefit you might get if you invest in cardiovascular disease, where the, the improvement could be quantified in the number of heart attacks avoided. So that's why often in these um, health technology assessment frameworks, they try and use a, a unit of benefit that could be uh, applied to all disease areas. And you mentioned that the quality adjusted life year, that is one of these units. And that's why it's so important to quantify variables such as the length of additional life that um, a particular regimen might allow and the quality of life, because it's, it's those two elements that um, make up this, this common unit, the quality. Michael, would it be interesting or, or necessary for the, those doing the CER or the HTA to understand the potential impact on the quality of life of an individual of even one bleed, especially if it was a serious bleed or life-threatening bleed? Oh, absolutely. And in fact, what this measure is, is an attempt to get at uh, what, what people and patients really care about. I, I'd also like to uh, uh, echo what Adam said about the importance of collecting lots of data in order to make uh, these cost-effectiveness and quality measurements more robust. Because hemophilia is a rare disease, the impetus is even greater to engage the entire community in the clinical research process. Ideally, everybody with the disease would be involved in clinical research. Everybody would be part of a registry, would get data collected in a systematic way, and everybody or most everybody would be participating in clinical trials. And this is especially important when you're dealing with a disease like hemophilia, which is rare, for which you do have effective treatments, but for which the treatments are expensive. And so maybe, again, let's look at this time as, as an opportunity. Instead of trying to, to fight this all off, use this as an opportunity to get the community engaged in doing the kind of research which will make care even better. So if you look at Sweden, for example, a country with a very good standard of haemophilia care, you're saying we should look at this as an opportunity to validate the fact that good haemophilia care is necessary, it's cost effective, it's worthwhile. Or even better, think about ways to, to, uh, uh, to make the care of this disease better than it is right now. Now in Europe with HTAs, Adam, they look for evidence-based data, they look for this from industry or from clinicians. Uh, do you also see a role uh, for evidential data to be gathered by the clinicians and by the patient organisations? Absolutely. I mean, HTA can appear to be quite dogmatic in the sort of data that it requires, you know, randomised controlled trials, meta-analyses, but at the end of the day, HTA invariably has a panel of experts making a decision. And if you can provide data to that group of individuals that show that the humanistic benefit of, um, of haemophilia treatment and, and sort of can really make the, the statistics become real to them, which exactly is what experiential data does and, and you know, the sort of data that patient associations can derive from their members, then that is going to definitely impact the ultimate decision. And all HTA bodies do have some leeway in, in how they make their decisions they may have a, a sort of a, a threshold of cost effectiveness that you know largely determines whether they recommend a treatment or whether they don't. But we have seen quite a lot of research, international research, that shows HTA bodies also you know, have very different recommendations uh, for different diseases and, and they take into account things like the unmet need and uh, the severity of the disease and indeed the rarity of the disease. So absolutely. Um, data that, and, and information that patient groups can provide um, about the, the patient experience is very important in, uh, in helping to inform the outcome of a, an HTA assessment.
Michael, when you're doing CERs in the USA, do you like to get input from patient organizations? Yeah, um, th this actually has been a, an important part of the debate. I work for the NIH, the National Institutes of Health, and we do have a number of mechanisms by which we routinely interact with patient organizations, with patient advocacy groups, with professional societies that themselves are very closely related to patients. This past year, there was a stimulus bill passed, and as part of it, $1.1 billion were specifically allocated to comparative effectiveness research. And as uh, in response to this, uh, the Agency for Health Research and Quality is going to dramatically increase their level of interaction with patient organizations, which I think is a very good thing. And they're also going to bring together patient organizations and funding agencies like the National Institutes of Health so that there is a greater connect between patient groups, patients themselves, and the clinical research community. So I think the message we're giving here really is that the, the patients need to get involved with their clinicians in ensuring that the data is being collected and the patient organizations themselves need to start gathering data that we can input into a process and don't be afraid of HTAs or CERs. Whether a HTA or CER will occur in your country in the year, the whole effectiveness of treatment is going to be looked at. Get involved, get involved early, that's how you get a good result. Absolutely. I think it's very important that payers do get that, that insight into the patient experience, particularly in a, a rare disease such as haemophilia. Okay, Adam Michael, thank you very much. Great. Thank you.